Hey everyone. Isn't it funny when the day of a really big, super important exam, you wake up with an excruciating stomach ache? Or, here's another one, isn't it just hilarious when after a really busy, super long week of work, you finally get to spend the weekend in bed with a massive migraine? Well, all of these symptoms might not actually be funny coincidences. First of all, because it's not very funny to be sitting in an exam room when literally the only place you'd rather be on Earth is anywhere near a toilet. But, most importantly, they may not be coincidences. That's right. Many scientists today believe that physical symptoms can be influenced by psychological factors that the stressors and feelings and emotions going on in our heads can have quite an impact on our health if left unresolved. So that would make one think. Can you do your body with your mind? That is going to be up to you to decide. What I'm here to do today is to highlight and explain the groundbreaking research that exists within the field of medicine and psychology and how the two can oftentimes relate how mental well-being doesn't just impact the mental, it can also promote physical well-being. And with this, how emotional expression and listening to your body can sometimes alleviate the physical symptoms that we are presented with. Yeah, so newsflash, suppressing and swallowing your emotions might not actually be that great for you, although very convenient. Annoying, I know. Another psychology girl telling me that my feelings are important and <laughs> I need to listen to them. Well, yeah. As a psychology, neuroscience, and medicine enthusiast, I have been venturing through these worlds since I was a 14-year-old girl. And in my journey, I have discovered just how capable us human beings are. I've read about just how powerful our brain is, and I've questioned just how much it can have an impact on our physical health. So, how powerful is our brain? Robert Ader was a psychologist in the 1970s, and at one point, he conducted experiments on rats in order to understand taste aversion. Basically, what he would do is give the rats sweetened water, paired with an immunosuppressant drug that killed them. He then decided to remove the drug and began giving the rats solely sweetened water. To his surprise, the rats who drank this water died of immunosuppression. So basically, some mental mechanism in the rat recognized this water to be harmful in some way. And just with that, just with that belief or memory or whatever, that was enough for some harmless, harmless sweetened water to suppress their immune system and kill them. This opened way into a whole new field of medicine, AKA <coughs> psychoneuroimmunology and psychoneuroendocrinology, both of which rejected the separation of these sciences when examining illness and instead focus on the impact that our brain and our psyche has on our physical health. We can see how this relates to the well-known mind-body concept in psychology, suggesting that the mind and body function as a whole rather than as separate entities, constantly communicating to each other and impacting one another via varying signals and cues. And guess what? In medicine, there's a concept known as interoception, which is our ability to perceive these signals and cues that are being sent. But what are these messages that I'm talking about? In what ways do our brains and body communicate? And how does this have anything to do with you healing your body with your mind? Well, let me give you an example, just so that maybe you can grasp the concept a little bit better. You see, for a period when I was in school, I used to get stomach aches every single morning 
without fail. I kept trying to switch up my breakfast, you know, I swapped out the toast for the eggs, the cereal for the granola, nothing was working. My body was doing anything to make me stay home and not go to school. It was sending me a sign that something was off. And it was right. I was a new girl and I didn't have many friends. And although it may sound silly, the eight hours of hell that I perceived were waiting me was enough for my body to perceive a potential threat and try to signal to me that something had to be done. And by me not dealing with this anxiety and just bottling it up and heading to school every day, the stomach aches went on for a couple of months until I made some friends and got used to my environment. Then they magically disappeared. To a later discovery, a study published by the American Academy of Pediatrics found that 79% of children with reoccurring abdominal pain had some sort of anxiety disorder. Does this mean that all stomach aches are caused by anxiety? Probably not. I mean, we've all gotten unlucky on a Taco Tuesday. <laughs> However, you can't deny how interesting it is that Sometimes our mental symptoms can transcend into physical ones. Speaking of, actually, I recently read a book called When the Body Says No by Dr. Gabor Mate, in which he explains his experience as a family doctor. Along his career, he noticed that when sitting down with some of his very ill patients and having a talk with them about their lives, most of them had some really serious stuff happen to them. Traumas and feelings from their past that were never brought to the surface, never expressed. Instead, they were suppressed for years and years. He decided that there must be some link here, that the mind and body of his patients couldn't possibly be functioning separately and that if one of the two was off, it must be impacting the other in some sort of way. This led to his discovery of the way in which, and I quote, histories, social contexts, and emotional patterns of human beings impact their health. Today, he preaches that all doctors evaluate their patients' mental situations as well as their physical ones. And there have been cases in which this has been seen to help, such as with fevers, actually. More specifically, a condition labeled today as a psychogenic fever, in which individuals experience an elevated body temperature, so a fever, except it happens after an emotional event, trauma, or stressor. And many studies have found that by alleviating the stressor, either by removing it completely, or just through talking about it, you know, through therapy, the fevers went away. Now, all of the things that I am mentioning are growing bodies of research. Nothing can really be for certain, seeing as how complicated us human beings are. But we can infer from all of this one common denominator. And that is that in some way, stress and anxiety and in general negative emotions that aren't dealt with can have impacts on our bodies. I mean, we've all heard of that before, right? Well, let me explain a potential reason why and it has something to do with our little friend, cortisol. <coughs> oh yes, the infamous so-called stress hormone. So bear with me and listen to this. When faced with a stressful situation, your brain signals to your adrenal glands to release cortisol alongside other hormones as a stress response. And the way cortisol works, basically its role, is to suppress our digestive system, it suppresses our immune system, it raises our blood sugar, all to ensure that our body is focused on survival. The thing is, is 
that our brain can't really distinguish whether we're getting chased by a tiger and are about to die, or we have an exam in a couple of weeks. Ridiculous. I know. But both of these situations can be stressful and therefore can initiate this fear response. And cortisol isn't bad. The human body makes no mistakes. This hormone is designed to help you handle immediate challenges. It's an adaptive response that we've needed in order to ensure our survival. <coughs> that is, in the short term. You see, once the stressful event is over, the body should return to its relaxed state, where our immune system is up and running, our digestive system is working, and everything is back to normal. The tricky part, is that sometimes this can be hard to achieve. Why? Because it's hard to navigate stress and anxiety, especially nowadays. I mean, before we were getting chased by lions and tigers, but once we found a cave to hide in, it was pretty clear to our brain that the response could be turned off, that we were safe. Today, with our very complex emotions, stress is often chronic persistent. Traumatic situations aren't always dealt with because it's not as easy as hiding in a cave away from all of your problems. You know, like when a bad thing happens in your day, but you have other stuff to worry about. I mean, I have to get myself home, then I have to make dinner, then I have to do the dishes, then I have to finish this super important work project. I don't have time to deal with all of the complex emotions happening in my day to day. So you push it down. I'll deal with it later. Do you know what that's called? Emotional suppression. And by doing this, our brain and body can't really be sure whether the bad situation is over yet or not. So then, we either prolong the stress continuously, or every time we think about the situation again, you know, it comes back up, we reactivate that reaction in our bodies because we haven't dealt with it. We haven't told ourselves that we're okay, that it's safe to relax. You don't need to keep suppressing my immune system, thank you very much. I'd rather not wake up with a fever tomorrow. And as we did see with the fevers, for example, talking about your feelings and what's happened is a way to work through them. Yes, work through your feelings. Resolve them inside of you in some way so that your brain and body do know that it's safe for you to relax, that you're free to exit survival mode. Oh, and also, listen to your body. When the sign of stress comes, don't push it down. That headache that you feel coming on after work, it might not be a coincidence. It might be your body trying to signal to you in some way it's exhaustion. Or the next time you take a trip and get back feeling worn out. Or the next time you experience an adverse emotional event that puts you aback. Sit with your feelings. Allow your body the time it needs to rest and relax and the time to heal. I know that life is so fast-paced nowadays that getting sick is the biggest, worst inconvenience of all. But trust me, with the mind and body working in union, a lot of the times there's signals being sent to you. And if we learn to listen to those signals, we can possibly avoid some annoying symptoms. So, from my own experiences, from Robert Ader's groundbreaking discoveries, from Gabor Mate's profound insights, and just from the eye-opening research that exists within the fields of medicine and psychology, it's pretty clear. Our mind and body aren't just connected. Oh no, they are in constant communication. And you can learn that language. Can you heal your body with your mind? Athletes who used imagery techniques during injury rehabilitation had an outstandingly fast 
recovery. Women in early stages of breast cancer who participated in cognitive behavioral stress management had an absurdly improved immune response. <coughs> so the answer is, I don't know. I don't know exactly if you can heal your body with your mind. I don't know if psychoneuroimmunology or psychoneuroendocrinology or psychoneuro anything is the one solution and reason and rhyme behind illness and health. What I do know is that suppressing your emotions isn't good. And what I do know is that our brain is extremely unique and potent and powerful. And we need to take advantage of that more. So yes. Listen to your feelings. Learn those signals. Learn that communication. And find that it might do wonders for your health. I'm Marisol Franzot. Thank you for watching my TED Talk.